Welcome to the Dr. Gundry Podcast. Belly fat. It's something many Americans have struggled with at one point or another. But carrying that extra weight around your midsection is doing so much more than standing in the way of you and your health goals. It's seriously harmful. In fact, my guests today say that excessive belly fat is one of the leading causes of cardiovascular and metabolic disease and that many of us are at risk, no matter how thin we might look. After a quick break, we'll hear from Dr. Paul Hahn and Hank Kim, the CEO and CSO of Bello, the world's first portable belly fat scanner. Bello is scientifically designed to directly measure lipids under the skin and provide an accurate measure of belly fat in a matter of seconds. It's been globally recognized for excellence in innovation and quality and has won the CES 2020 Innovation Awards honoree and the IF 2020 Design Award. And in just a minute, we're going to talk all about it. We will reveal why so many of us struggle with belly fat, what it may indicate about our health, and why simply stepping on the scale is not enough. We'll also share how the Bellow device could help you decode your belly fat and better manage your health. Many of the listeners may not know this, but there are actually multiple types of belly fat. Can you explain the difference between visceral and subcutaneous fat? Is one more concerning than the other, and, and why would that be? Uh, subcutaneous fat is located right under the skin. It regulates the body temperature and protects the body from external shocks. Think of a distended belly fat protrude above the once Beltrime, the kind people often think about when they call someone fat or obese. On the other hand, visceral fat refers to fat attached to the organs of the human body, not the skin. Generally, it refers to fat that adheres to the bodily organs, such as the liver, large intestine, and small intestine. It may not always be obvious that someone has an issue with visceral fat because it may not always show the way subcutaneous fat does. So just say, uh, you know, in the United States, we have this expression of having love handles. And those are the, you know, the fat that sometimes just protrudes above your, your belt. And, but that's not visceral fat, um, is, that's what you're saying. And I think one of the striking things, and I was, before I was a heart surgeon, I was a general surgeon, so I was in the, the belly uh, quite a bit. And you're right, there's, uh, there's a tremendous amount of fat that occurs inside of our belly that really has nothing to do with what's sitting on the outside. And I've actually written about the fact that this visceral fat is also on the arteries of the heart. And interestingly enough, the more fat that's on the outside of the heart, the more likely that somebody is going to develop heart disease. So it's, uh, and this is also visceral fat. So I think uh, knowing the difference between subcutaneous fat or maybe love handles and what's really inside, I think is actually really important. Now, uh, does the weight, how does the weight visceral fat accumulate in the first place? Uh, can you share what the underlying mechanisms are. I've written about this, but I want to hear your take as well. Okay, uh, before we go further, you know, the, I would like to explain a little more about, you know, the why this fat is more dangerous, you know. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, the, the basically, uh, the circuitous fat and visceral fat, uh, neither are great. However, you know, while subcutaneous fat acts as an energy source located under the skin, a visceral fat does not stay in one place. Uh, this is the fat that uh, travels throughout the body in one's bloodstream. 
So as it moves, you know, it accumulates in various uh, bodily organs, such as the liver and heart, something like that. In addition, you know, excess visceral fat is particularly dangerous because it releases chemicals uh, that cause various uh, cardiovascular diseases and even cancer. To summarize all of this, you know, the subcutaneous fat is the cause of externally messing up your body or uh, damaging your external aesthetics. And the visceral fat is the cause of internally messing up your health. And uh, if I explain uh, more about this, you know, uh, 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 there are many reasons to, uh, you know, the why our the midsection, you know, is a more, you know, the the bigger and fatter, you know, something like that, and the accumulated more fast. The, however, uh, one major reason is because our weight. Uh, is very closely uh, related to our eating habit. Uh, and the main cause of this is excessive calorie intake. Uh, for example, uh, excessive intake of carbs uh, turns into fat. And uh, especially as people get older, you know, uh, since the enzyme that uh, synthesizes fat is activated in the abdomen rather than the limbs, uh, more fat accumulates uh, in the abdomen than in any other part of the body. And uh, hormonal changes are also an important factor in midsection weight gain. Uh, this is especially uh, so uh, uh, in the case of a woman because they experience a rapid uh, decrease in female hormones as they reach middle to late ages. Uh, these hormonal changes interfere with the uh, breakdown of fat and creating an environment in which uh, uh, physical fat is accumulated more easily. Also, uh, alcohol uh, also contribute to this. Uh, it does not cause an accumulation of fat, but it is very high in calories and uh, does not make you feel full, so uh, leading to overeating. Therefore, uh, it is recommended to avoid excessive snacking while drinking. And uh, a lack of exercise is also uh, one of the main causes of uh, weight gain. And if you don't exercise, you know, you will gradually lose muscle and your body will begin to easily accumulate fat. But other than these reasons, you know, the body naturally accumulates a lot of fat in the abdomen. There are tens of thousands of reasons why the abdomen is vulnerable to fat accumulation. So just um, in, the, in the United States, liposuction is very popular for aesthetics, but uh, a lot of people don't realize that liposuction is just getting rid of subcutaneous fat. It's not actually getting rid of visceral fat. Is that right? Excuse me? I so, your... so when people go and have liposuction, and they see the, their fat uh, disappear, I've actually had a lot of patients come back and tell me that they, you know, they had all their fat removed so they don't have any fat anymore. But liposuction doesn't remove visceral fat. That's, that's a misnomer. Uh, there, I mean, I could remove visceral fat and you know, take it out of your abdomen, but I don't recommend it uh, for, as a surgical procedure. So I think, the, I think your point is well taken. People can have an aesthetically pleasing result with liposuction, but be unaware that there's actually a silent killer still inside their belly. Is, is that a good way of saying that? Yes, right. And uh, I, I like your point. Uh, many people are, I think, aware of what we call a beer belly. Um, and that's actually visceral fat that's accumulating from uh, excessive carbohydrate and alcohol uh, intake. So it's a real thing. Correct. Oh, okay. Uh, you know what? In general, uh, the, if the lower abdomen is convex or uh, there is a lot of fat in thighs or buttocks, you know, it can be considered as a subcutaneous fat type. 
And of course, this is difficult to get rid of easily with just a nutrition and exercise plan, uh, especially in women. Uh, after uh, childbirth or uh, menopause, a lot of fat accumulates in the abdomen under the influence of hormones. Uh, these cases are more difficult to eliminate as they are deeply associated with uh, uh, circulatory disorders. Uh, in this case, you know, through aerobic exercise or core exercise, uh, you might need to burn fat cells and promote blood circulation to create a muscle to replace fat. On the other hand, you know, if the upper abdomen is convex, uh, uh, there are many cases of visceral fat. Again, uh, uh, this visceral fat is also not easy uh, to remove. The best way to reduce uh, it is to use that fat uh, as an uh, energy source through a proper exercise and diet. However, you know, uh, there are people who have experienced the cases where uh, their belly fat remains the same even after losing weight uh, through uh, good management. Uh, there also will be uh, uh, some people who have high body fat measurement despite their slim figure. Uh, this is usually called the lean obesity or uh, skinny obesity. And even in this case, you know, visceral fat types become more prominent. In order to get rid of uh, visceral fat, uh, it is important uh, to uh, uh, not only diet and exercise, but also uh, combine a various methods such as uh, lowering uh, your blood sugar and insulin uh, through, uh, for example, uh, fasting uh, for more than uh, 12 hours and allowing your fat uh, to be more efficiently broken down. Uh, obviously, you know, the, according to uh, the, the advice of your primary doctor. Yeah, uh, I, I think that's a really uh, important point. And I, I emphasize that in, in a lot of my books, like The Energy Paradox, that one of the best ways, particularly when diet and exercise don't necessarily address visceral fat, that intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating uh, really is where this really attacks the underlying problem. And, you know, I, I think you're right. There is such a thing as, you know, a skinny obesity um, that uh, is, is actually more common than people might know. And I think that's one of the things I really like about your device is that people uh, think about, well, I get on the scale and my weight is normal, or I even, I look at my body mass index, BMI, and by my, my body mass index is normal. But then when we start with very almost invasive means looking at body fat and where it's located, Many of these people are uh, shocked that even though they're skinny, they're, they're actually obese in, in their abdomen, in their visceral fat, where it shouldn't be. Now, I think one of the exciting things is, as many of our listeners know, there are, there are ways to measure uh, visceral fat that frequently involve uh, rather invasive procedures, whether they're uh, x-rays or whether they're whole body immersion. But I want to, I want to, the reason I'm excited about the Bella device is because you guys have figured out how to make this measurement, how to have people see what their visceral fat is uh, in an easy handheld device. So let's, let me, let's talk about your device, Bello. Uh, it's intended to help users understand and support their metabolic health. So first of all, we use this term a lot, and I think most of my viewers and listeners understand the importance of metabolic health. But I'd like to hear it from you. What, how do you, what is metabolic health in your idea? You know, metabolism refers to the overall chemical reaction that coordinates every cell in the body to function properly 
to store or produce energy. Metabolic function manages energy for basic life support activities and controls the production and consumption of energy that is necessary for various human activities. If your metabolism slows down, it can result in your body operating inefficiently and increases your chances of causing health problems in the long run. So what does that have to do with, with belly fat in particular? Is that just a, a good way of assessing overall metabolic health? Uh, there are many risk factors for developing metabolic syndrome. Some well-known factors include insulin and blood sugar. Abdominal obesity and visceral fat are known to cause high blood sugar by interfering with normal activity of insulin. As a result, uric acid may increase and lipid metabolism may suffer. These symptoms eventually lead to other complications and chronic disease. So abdominal fat is deeply linked to diseases such as diabetes, high blood pressure, and cardiovascular disease. It can also cause problems with your blood vessels. Visceral fat travels throughout the body and accumulates along the walls of blood vessels. The accumulated fat pops out from these walls as the lump grows and turns into the blood clot, which, um, as you know well, causes heart attack or stroke. In short, visceral fat is a time bomb. You're absolutely right. In fact, uh, years ago, I was actually going to write a book, and I even drew the cover that uh, of a of a fat belly, and there was a, a time bomb uh, in there, and it, the the book was going to be called Time Bomb. I, you you couldn't have said it better. It it literally is a time bomb. So why everybody's going to go? Well, wait a minute. Why can't I just hop on the scale every now and then? Doesn't, doesn't my weight give a good indication of my health? Um, as you know, uh, it's true that weight is the easiest indicator of our health status. Of course, we need to control weight well. However, it's difficult to determine abdominal obesity, especially visceral fat, with just numbers on a scale. So, there are people who have visceral fat despite their lean body type, and there are others who have visceral fat and metabolic disease due to genetic factors or harmful habits, such as drinking alcohol and smoking, even despite regular diet and exercise. And I mentioned before, uh, and I, you probably would agree with me, so even if I get my BMI checked, and there's a lot of scales that check BMI, or I can look at a chart and look at my BMI, why isn't that enough? What are the problems with just measuring uh, body mass index? Okay, uh, a BMI, or a body mass index, is a weight divided by height squared. It presumes that uh, most overweight people are also fat, a while, you know, and uh, a while this is often true, uh, there are many exceptions. Uh, men and women with a greater than average muscle mass will weigh more and have higher BMI, but uh, maybe more well than others with uh, a lower BMI. Uh, and conversely, uh, uh, there may be individuals who weigh less than average but have lower than average muscle mass and are more fat uh, without appearing to be obese. And uh, uh, nowadays, uh, it has become uh, very common to measure uh, body composition as well as weight uh, using a smart BIA scales that measure body composition. But uh, if I uh, strictly uh, speaking, you know, uh, the measurement uh, uh, provided by these smart scales are not true measurement, but predictions. The BIA technology uh, measures the uh, impedance of the torso, arms, and legs by sending uh, a uh, minute electrical signal through the uh, body to estimate the amount of water 
contained in the body. Uh, so uh, it is it is just a technology that uh, predict uh, body composition by formulations uh, based uh, on the measured water content. Uh, it is a technology that uh, continues to evolve, but it has some uh, major gaps. So uh, a chief among them is uh, its technological uh, limitations that uh, measure uh, only the moisture content. Uh, since uh, the amount of water uh, in the body composition is taken as a muscle mass, uh, people with a lot of water in their epidermis tissue may be mistaken for having a lot of muscle mass. Thus, uh, there can be a big changes in their composition according to uh, their hydration status, such as diet, uh, water intake, and urination. So. The best way to overcome uh, these limitations and to uh, measure how much uh, visceral fat is actually accumulated is uh, through a radiographic uh, method such as uh, CASCAN or DEXA. However, uh, if you have to be exposed to uh, radiation every single time you measure your belly fat, you know, <laughs> other problems may arise. Uh, because of this, you know, uh, we use uh, near infrared uh, technology, in other words, uh, nurse technology, uh, instead of radiation to measure visceral fat. Uh, so, uh, uh, since our nurse technology directly measures uh, total uh, hemoglobin, uh, hemoglobin concentration, oxygen saturation in capillaries and water and lipid and the tissue of interest, it overcomes the limitation of a BIA technology and analyzes body composition more accurately by minimizing other interference. So I can say that, you know, consistent quantitative measurement is the most optimal technique for uh, standardizing health indicators. Yeah, I, I'd echo that. Uh, I have one of these impedance scales, and I actually have several of them, and I have them in my office. But uh, you can fool these scales uh, actually very easily. Uh, many people uh, retain about two pounds of water during the day, and since the conductance of electricity depends on you know salt water transmission and fat is a good insulator, Many of my patients um, are, sh are shocked when at the end of the day they may weigh more, but it says they've lost significant amount of body fat. And, it's, and I use that as an example to, to show my patients that this technology uh, can be fooled very easily. You're right, depending on your hydration status. So it's, I, you know, it's, it's okay, but what why I really wanted to have you on the program is that you've, you've taken this to a much more accurate level. So let, let's talk about this near-infrared spectroscopy, NERS. How long has this technology been, been around? Uh, NERS technology has been uh, used for uh, several decades and used in various fields since the 1990s. Uh, in the meantime, Optical devices such as light sources and detectors have developed rapidly. And the method of implementing technologies and computational models have also made a variety of developments. And uh, even now, you know, research is continuing in various fields and it is a trend to apply the appropriate technology implementation method according to as a measurement purpose and uh, commercializing. So how, how has this uh, s system been used in the past? Where, where was it its applications before Bella? Okay. Uh, it is used in uh, various fields, but it will, uh, I will briefly talk about it uh, only in the medical and healthcare field. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you look at the research field, it is typically used in advancing brain uh, hemodynamics research and the functional imaging research of soft tissue cancer, such as breast cancer diagnosis. Of course, uh, it is not limited uh, there too, and 
And there are various research cases uh, regarding this. Uh, in terms of uh, commercialized product, uh, there are multiple oximetry devices for measuring oxygen saturation, uh, such as pulse oximeter and brain oximeter. In addition, uh, you know, uh, sports-related wearable devices and imaging devices for functional neuroimaging or perfusion in extremity tissues are also being uh, developed. So uh, many people, when they use a device uh, of any sort, they want to know, well, is it safe? It, it sounds like you're, you're going to beam beams through my belly and uh, oh, what's, yes. that, what's that going to do? Oh, okay. So you're, you're asking about safeness, right? Right. So, definitely it's safe, you know. In general, uh, for accurate uh, quantitative uh, body composition measurement, uh, radiation-based equipment uh, such as CASCAN or DEXA must be used. Uh, however, uh, an IR has a longer uh, wavelength, which means it has a weaker energy than uh, that of visible and UV, ultraviolet wavelengths. So uh, our devices use a very uh, safe technology that raises no concerns about the radiation exposure. Uh, in addition to safety, you know, if I say, you know, the, it is very simple to use and only take a few seconds to scan by contacting the device with the scan. Yeah, and one of the things I was impressed with your device, that your, your technology, the accuracy uh, has been compared to, you know, the gold standard of DEXA and CAT scans. How, can you tell me about what those studies found comparing Bello to the, the gold standards? Okay. Um, uh, since the field of nurse technology is, uh, is a field with so many different studies, it is difficult uh, to mention all of them. Uh, also, the evaluation of accuracy uh, varies depending on the purpose of use. However, among uh, many studies, uh, it can uh, be said that the study of the optical properties of absorption and scattering for object applied to Bellow, our product, has already achieved considerable result. A significant research and result on the accuracy of nurse technology have been reported uh, quite frequently. And it can be said that uh, the accuracy has already been proven through a measurement uh, comparison with existing uh, diagnostic equipment such as CAT scan, DEXA, and MRI. Uh, even now, uh, many related researches are in progress and our company is also conducting research for further development of the technology. So I think uh, this area will become more sophisticated uh, in the future. And uh, Bello, our device, is also a product that has been validated for uh, its accuracy through uh, clinical research. In addition, uh, upcoming product such as a next-gen Bello and the uh, uh, muscle measuring uh, device called Fido, which you are about to release, uh, are also being developed through uh, conducting uh, clinical research correlating with the CASCAN and DEXA in Korea and United States. Uh, in this study, you know, our product shows around at least 92% and up to 97% of measurement accuracy depending on items uh, compared to those reference equipment. Now, I know you, you developed Bello, uh, you know, to look for visceral fat and to have a quick and portable and rapid assessment of visceral fat. But do you, do you see potential for this whole technology to be a way of e early disease detection? Uh, for instance, how, how do you see this comparing to ultrasound, uh, MRI, or to CT scans? Okay. Um, uh, doctors. doctors often rely on visible data such as endoscopy, x-rays, and MRIs, as you said, you know, to make a diagnosis. Uh, in the past, uh, doctors depended heavily on experience and intuition, but now 
uh, with the development of diagnostic devices, they have the technology to look into a patient's body uh, without incision. Uh, it is true that possibility of early detection of, uh, of a disease has dramatically increased, but there are cases in which uh, the uh, general public still misses uh, the diagnosis or refuses to diagnosis due to their concern about radiation exposure. Um, compared to x-rays and ultrasound that see and interpret the structure or shape of tissues, a nurse technology provides functional images to see and interpret uh, physiological changes. So uh, Bello measures the quantitative uh, values of hemoglobin, uh, fat, and water uh, in the subcutaneous tissues by irradiating several near-infrared rays uh, based on the values that are uh, analyzed by putting those data into a specific algorithm and it finds out what changes are occurring in our body and predicts or which disease risk factors are at uh, high levels. Hmm. So do you see this technology dominating the diagnostic market in the future? I mean, it sounds like it has tremendous potential. Oh, yeah. At this moment, uh, it cannot be said that nurse technology will replace the existing diagnostic technology. However, it's now in the stage of confirming its scalability through clinical trials. The best example is the early detection of breast cancer. For example, when cancerous tissues are formed in the breast, new blood vessels are created. Because sugar and oxygen are consumed, repeat drops, and hydrolytic enzymes increase. By measuring the quantitative values of these changes, a malignancy index can be calculated and compared with the patient's current physical conditions. Hmm. And, and will you be initiating or are there on clinical studies that are gonna start using this for that purpose? Yes, we are conducting clinical studies in Korea all right. So would you recommend Bello users share their data with their doctors? And I might add that the Bello device is available. It's, it's fully approved. People can purchase the device. Uh, would you recommend the Bello users share their data with their doctors? Uh, or how do you best make sense of the data for themselves? Okay, you know, uh, definitely I recommend it. Uh, we initially developed uh, this product as a personal device, but uh, we are working to expand it to business to business platforms, such as clinics and medical institution. Uh, doctors and other uh, medical pro professionals have indicated the value of being able to monitor a patient a metabolic risk factor without uh, having to conduct more invasive diagnostics, but uh, having a tool uh, to measure and encourage uh, patients to continue on their wellness journey. So the best way uh, is to use uh, this device is, you know, using consistently. So I think that the uh, starting point to understand, uh, understanding your own data is by measuring uh, your fat regularly every day or once every two, three days and tracking and managing uh, how the major data moves. And, uh, uh, you know, if you put this device on your desk or uh, in a drawer, it, it is just a cool looking gadget. However, uh, if you use it on a daily basis and see how your condition is changing over time, it's like, uh, you know, having a personal trainer uh, in the palm of your hands. Yeah, I, I agree. It is a cool looking device. And it is uh, incredibly light well, weight and ergonomic, and I was uh, shocked personally with how easy it is to use and actually what a sophisticated it, device it is, despite looking small and user-friendly. Uh, so congratulations on that. Now, okay, so, so, I'm, so what if I'm a pretty healthy person? Um, 
is Bell is using a Bella still beneficial? Uh, I don't want to say that a Bella is necessary for everyone. <laughs> uh, if you are, <laughs> if you are a paragon of health and fitness, and uh, you have all the tools to maintain the, that that kind of status, you know, then perhaps uh, you can do without Bella. However, uh, as we have discussed, you know, uh, just because you look healthy, it does not always mean you are. So if you are someone who cares uh, not only about aesthetics, uh, but your overall metabolic health and want a simple and reliable way to measure and improve it, then you should check, it, check out Bellow. Uh, just to place Bellow on your belly and uh, with the press of a button, then uh, figure out what's happening in your body. Yeah, um, it's a, I don't suppose either one of you has a bellow device handy to hold up to the camera. Yes, right here. Ah, there they are. <laughs> I mean, these these it's are. It's just pump size. Yeah, they're 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 very they're very small, and like I say, uh, the information that you get is sent to an app on your phone, and. Uh, I, I think it's kind of fun. I've purposely uh, tried to gain weight and the, the bellow detected it and it detected it going into my visceral fat and then I purposely w lost that weight and I, I can do that at will. And the bellow tracked it very well. So. Uh, it was not fooled, despite me, I guess, trying to fool it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a great device. Well, th this has been great. Uh, so where can listeners learn more about Bello and, and your work? Uh, your listeners can find out more about Bello and purchase the device on our website, but also from many other online shops, including Amazon, or Walmart, and CBS. Uh, Lifetime Fitness Marketplace in UAC and Brookston and more places. Uh, also, uh, uh, Bello has just uh, returned with uh, more powerful functions and enhanced the services, which is a next-gen Bello. Uh, we are currently crowdfunding on Indiegogo. Uh, in addition, a product called Fido uh, that can measure and create the mass and quality of muscles by area of interest, which he has already won the Innovation Award at CES 2022 uh, 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 will be launched next year. Uh, you can find out more about our new products by visiting our online store at shop.olivehc.com. Great. And, and we'll put that up for our viewers to see. Yeah, well, you know, congratulations on this technology. You've really, I think, brought another aspect to those of us who are interested in our personal fitness or personal health and uh, it's it's really easy to use i think it gives some important information that you know here to four was only available with a with a cat scan or a dexa scan and you're right most people don't want to do that uh, nor <laughs> nor nor should they uh, i think i should should add all right. Well, both of you, thanks very much for coming on the, on the podcast. And uh, we'll keep uh, in touch and looking forward to the next innovation from you. It's really exciting work. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. All right. Thank you. All right. It's time for our audience question. This qu week's question comes from Mohammed Bellatar, who says, Thank you, sir, for all this good information. I have a question, please. What do you think about apple cider vinegar? Well, I think apple cider vinegar is actually wonderful. And actually, I think vinegars in general are some of the best health promoting tools that you should use, whether you use them as shots, whether you use them in salad dressings. In my upcoming book, Unlocking the Keto Code, you're gonna see why vinegars are so important to get into your diet and get into your body and the reason why they work i think is going to really surprise you so that's a great question 
please enjoy your apple cider vinegar. If any of you uh, watched my interview with Orlando Bloom, uh, we toasted each other with shots of apple cider vinegar. Uh, he's a big fan as well. Review of the week. This week's review comes from Wanda McLaughlin, who says, You saved my life. I came across your Plant Paradox book three years ago. I have read it four times, as well as your longevity book. They are always out highlighted and color flags because I am constantly referring to them. And I also have your cookbooks. Thank you, Dr. Gundry. You truly did save my life. Well, Wanda, thank you for writing about that. Uh, again, this is why I do this. This is why I continue to see patients. This is why I continue to write. And this is why I do the Dr. Gundry podcast. For people like you and all my viewers and listeners, because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. We'll see you next week. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. Mm -hmm.